If you're with us for the first time uh, this morning, we have been going through the book of 1 Peter, and today is the seventh and final message, but if it's been a while since you've read the book of 1 Peter, I would encourage you uh, during your personal devotions this week to just read through the book of 1 Peter because, you know, as a church, we've just been blown away how timely God's word has been for such a time as this, and we've been studying 1 Peter, and and you know one of the things that we need in this world right now is is humility, and that's where that's where these words from 1 Peter wrap up today with the doxology as well. So 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 5 through 11, Peter writes, "Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud." but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As everyone kind of transitions here, feel free to adjust yourself. If it's too cold in the shade, go in the sunshine, then halfway through the sermon it'll be too too warm in the sunshine. You have to move the, the cold shade again. You can be like Pastor Clint. You can kick back, get those feet up. If you need to cover your eyes for your morning nap, that's fine. Uh, but I'm here for you. But good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. What an exciting time to be outside, huh? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love the fall. And this reminds me of that fall weather. And I mean, I had my first pumpkin spice latte on Tuesday. Yeah, all right. So praise praise God. Praise God. But it's amazing being out here because you get to experience so many things that God created, right? The grass that we don't have to think about. We don't have to ask God. Uh, I don't pray every morning, God, please grow grass. Please make trees happen. Please give me air to breathe. Please give me water to drink. I mean, it's amazing what our bodies do by themselves without us asking, right? I mean, Marissa's sitting over there right now soaking up the vitamin D from the sun, right? We learned about that on just Monday, maybe? Maybe last week, Wednesday. 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 Just Wednesday, right? Just getting that vitamin D just from the sunshine. Things you don't have to pray for. Things you don't have to think about. We just let God take care of it. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going through this book of 1 Peter, right? And I'm going to go through each chapter a little bit. And Peter is talking to this new church that's being grieved by various trials, meaning they're under persecution. They're being eaten by lions, right? They're literally emperor Nero's thrown into the lions. They're being burned at the stake. They're being ostracized by society. But you know what Peter says? He says, let God take care of it. So after I say a phrase, I'm going to hold up my hand, church, and you're going to repeat, let God take care of it. Let's try it right now. Let, let God, God take, take care, care of it. it. Absolutely. So chapter 1. Are you grieved by various trials? Uh, 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 wait, you gotta wait for the hand. He's, he's, he's signaling. He's used to being in charge. Are you grieved by various trials, church? Are you feeling the persecution? Let God take care of it. Very good. Do you have trouble with civil authorities? This is chapter two. Do they feel unjust? Well, you know what? Listen to them anyway. God put them into position of authority. And you know what? Let God take care of it. That's right. Chapter three. He says, do not repay reviling for reviling. Do not repay evil for evil. When you're being persecuted, instead, seek to bless those who are persecuting you. And then, let God take care of it. That's right. Chapter 4, you feeling pressured by society? Is society pushing you in a direction that you don't want to go, that feels maybe ungodly, against your moral character? Well, guess what? Continue to love them and stand firm in faith and... Let God take care of it. I'm losing a few of you. Let's try that again. Let God take care of it. Very nice. Chapter 5, the first half of chapter 5, Pastor Clint preached on last week. Are you afraid to serve? Are you afraid to serve the youth of today? Youth, are you afraid to serve the elders of today? Are you both afraid to listen to each other? Maybe it takes up too much of your time. Maybe you just don't feel like you have the time to serve. Well, you know what? Peter tells you, serve them anyway. And... 
Let God, Let God take, take care, care of it. That's right. And that kind of closes that first big section. And I'm at that section right at the end, just a couple verses, right? Have you ever written an essay before, right? You have your intro, body one, body two, body three, all your, you know, if you're doing the good five paragraph essay, right? I'm on, I just finished paragraph four. You start your what? Conclusion, right? This is where Peter gives you all this evidence, writes everything else. And then he says, therefore... He doesn't say therefore, but it's just like, you know, that therefore, comma, and then you got to come up with your conclusion. Peter gives you all that and then says, therefore, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And this is that key sentence that kind of unlocks the rest of the book that just happened and everything else that's going on after that. So let's break it down just a little bit, right? There's two big key phrases for you to take home today. That's the first one. God opposes the proud and gives grace to to the humble. So what does that mean? Let's talk about the word pride. Now, I feel like the word pride gets a bad rep. I do. I feel like it gets a bad reputation. Why? When I was a kid, I would do anything. I just want to hear my dad say what? Son, I'm proud of you. Absolutely. I still want to hear it today. I want to hear it when I'm at work. I want to hear it when I'm at home. I want to hear it from my parents when they call me. Why? It just, it moves me. Not all pride is bad. Don't worry, I'll get to that, but not all pride is bad, because that is that, you know, this pride word. But when we have that kind of other person attached to it, that love for them, I take great joy and satisfaction in your accomplishments and what you've done, right, in that complementarianism that Samantha was talking about. It's the kind of pride that God says in the baptism of Jesus right? Jesus is baptized and he says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. It's not self-focused, it's other focused, right? When God created human beings, when God created this grass that you're on, this air that we're breathing, the water behind us, even the feral cats and skunks that are back there, just, <laughs> just so you have a warning, there are a few, right? We saw them this morning, they almost had it out right over there, it was good. But God created all these things we didn't have to think of, and he said, hey, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, but you know what, you? You are very good, God says. I created humans, and they were very good. So that pride's not a bad thing, and that's the pride that God even indulges in. But then there's the word pride that kind of contaminates the whole thing. Right? And this kind of pride is better translated as haughtiness and arrogance. If you want to know what haughtiness means, just say it once. And whatever you feel like when you say it, that's what it means. <laughs> Try it with me. Haughtiness. 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 Yep, that's exactly what it means. Right? I'm full of myself. You even have to tip your chin when you say it. Right? It's that kind of arrogance. That's where Proverbs says, you know, pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. Right? Kind of like the fall that we had. Right? When there was a serpent slithering around in the Garden of Eden, approaches Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, guess what? I've got something for you. It's right over there. It's going to be great. You, too, will be like God if you eat from that tree. Right? That apple, that knowledge of good and evil, whatever fruit it was. And that kind of pride is, I don't need you, pride. That's taking pride in my own accomplishments. That's not taking pride in others or taking pride... Um, in that sense of joy we feel with family. No, this is, I don't need you, because look what I've done. Right? To be considered equal with God means what? It means I don't need God. And that's the pride that goes before fall. That's the pride that serpent was getting Adam and Eve in trouble for. And that's the pride that caused our fall. You have that sense of pride. God, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. Then the rest of the phrase says, God opposes the pride and gives grace to the humble. Well, guess what? I think the word humble and humility also get a bad rep. What does that mean? Humility is that really sweet word we're supposed to say all the time at church, aren't we? Well, we typically say humble in this kind of context today, don't we? When someone's really rich and they got a ton of money, but... You know, they don't really boast about how successful they are. We use that word humble. Oh, you know, they sold a million dollars worth of potatoes this year, but you wouldn't hear it from them because they're so humble. Or maybe you hear about it today, like kind of in a lifestyle. Oh, you know, I know they have a lot of money, but look, look how meagerly they live. Look at that humble lifestyle. Or it's 
almost used as an insult even. Oh, look how humbly they live, meaning, oh, they're probably poor and they don't have very much money, so they live a very humble life. That's the context in which it gets twisted today. And that's not the humility that God means, right? Yeah? I hope you're nodding because I'm about to inform you. That's not the humility that God means. It's not about the million dollars worth of potatoes. It's not about what's going on. Essentially, what we call humbleness or humility today is someone who's not very boastful or extravagant, right? Yeah, I see the nodding. You would agree with me. That's what I would have agreed with, too, until a couple weeks ago when I had to write this sermon. Clint gave you the sermon. He said, you need to learn what humility means. <laughs> two of the day, right? If you go home with only two things, it's these two things. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Thing number two, this is a quote that's often attributed to C.S. Lewis, other big leaders. Everyone wants to take credit for it. Why? Well, because it's so good, right? The second one is this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but of yourself less. I'll say that one more time. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but of yourself less. Less. I'm going to make sure I say it to all three sides over here. Humility is not thinking the less of yourself, but of yourself less. Well, what does that mean? Why shouldn't you think of yourself as less? Downgrading, yeah. What was that? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. I'll give you a big clue. It's the reason you're here right now. God made you. God made you. She was excited. She didn't even read my sermon. God made you. That's right. God's got a few things to say about that, right? Just like this in Isaiah. But now, says the Lord, he who created you, he who formed you, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. Right? Don't think less of yourself. There's a God who formed you and a God that redeemed you. He went through that effort, through that work. The God who created all this, created the world we breathe, the heaven, the stars, and the sky, came down to redeem you. You, Jesus says, why? Even the number of hairs on your head, the hair, the number of hairs on your head are all numbered, right? For some of us, that's more, some of us, that's less, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, fear not, for you are more value than any sparrow. You have more value than any other thing, God says, that I have ever created. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession. This is in First Peter. This is earlier in chapter 2. You are a chosen people. God handpicked you to inspire you with faith. A royal priesthood, royal, we're serving the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He has chosen you not just to be redeemed, but for service as well. That he may proclaim his excellencies to you, that he will call you out of darkness. We're talking the God who created everything took the effort to come down and call you out of the darkness of sin that you're in into his glorious light. For those of you in the shade, I guess that's not yet. But like, these people over here on the sides, right? He's called you into that glorious light. Then Paul writes in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So we're talking Jesus, God of God, equal with God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, came down to die, to suffer, to feel that pain that we feel when we suffer every day and somewhere beyond that. To redeem you. You're saved by God. He loves you. He formed you in the womb, we read. He died for you. You are precious in His sight. You are very good in His creation. You have no reason to think of yourself as less. Right? You have no reason to think less of yourself. And why would you when God values you so highly? Why would you value yourself less when God values you so highly? That's part one of humility. Don't think of yourself as less when God values you so highly. Because of that, we can think less about ourselves, right? Because of that, we can think of ourselves less. Peter writes this, humble yourselves, right? Humble yourselves means 
Know the value that God has placed on you. How highly God values you. And then think less of yourself. Humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all anxieties on him because he cares for you. Cast all anxieties on him. Anybody come in with maybe one or two anxieties today? <laughs> Eyebrows go up. Maybe one or two. Well, since you don't have any, let me tell you about my week real quick. <laughs> because my week probably sounds, I don't say it for pity, I don't say it for sympathy, I, I say my week because... I think you had one that was pretty similar, right? So literally, uh, let's go even a little further back than a week, because today's Sunday. Let's, uh, so a year ago, no. Let's just go, let's go about uh, eight, eight days ago, right? So, so last week, my wife started school, right? Teaching's about to happen. You know, we're all excited. It's Wednesday. So Tuesday, I take a vacation day. Why? Because we got to get our room ready. So there's a little anxiety. We got to get the room ready. We got to get the, everything's got to be clean. Everything's got to be present because the kids are coming with face masks. School starts on Wednesday. So Tuesday goes by. Wednesday happens. High anxiety. Everyone's wearing masks. First day of school. How's this going to work? There's required mask breaks. I don't know. Tensions are riding high. She has to stay a little bit late. Tensions high at home. Trying to get dinner ready. Take care of the kids. That's that. Thursday rolls around. Again, another high tension day. All right, it's our first full official day of school. Uh, we gotta, she's gotta keep everything planned. That means everything around the house is getting a little, little wonky do, right? That's okay, that's just how it happens. So we roll through with Thursday. So good thing she's got everything handled because Friday rolls around and school's canceled. <laughs> So schools canceled because, if you haven't heard about this, right, the air quality was so bad, there were fires going on everywhere in Idaho and in California. So they cancel school because they have to wear face masks in school. And because you're wearing face masks in school, you have required mask breaks in between classes where you go outside for five minutes and take off your mask. Well, they can't go outside for those five minutes to take off their mask because of the smoke. So school's canceled. So you're like, oh, so then we're trying to reorganize everything. Don't worry, because we got church coming. Oh, I can't wait for church. I'm going to just worship. I'm going to be filled halfway through church. My wife's got to leave. Why? Well, my son Caleb's not feeling well. Okay, well, so he goes to the doctor. And, you know, he's got a virus. He's teething. Uh, he's got the total package going on. Virus, teething. There was one more thing. Allergies. Allergies. Thank you very much, because why not? Let's throw it on the fire. Right? <laughs> He's got everything going on. So he's got a fever. He can't go to daycare. Why? Oh, no. So she's got to take Monday off of school. She takes him to the doctor. I come home. I got to take care of the kids right after that so she can get some work done. Tuesday rolls around. He still has a fever. So I got to take a half a day off of work. I try and work on this sermon. That's why I have to tell you this long story because I didn't write very much. <laughs> so I got to work on this sermon. And then all of a sudden, lunchtime rolls around. Good. He's going to take a nap. I can write my sermon. My wife, took, I took a half day. She took a half day. She goes to work. He won't nap. Oh, man. He's finally feeling very good. Wednesday rolls around. He can finally go to daycare. <laughs> Praise God, right? It's going to be a normal day. That, that, that afternoon, my wife calls me. Hey, Robert Stewart just had its first case of coronavirus. There's a bunch of teachers on 14-day quarantine. 48 eighth graders have to stay home, and she has an hour-long meeting after school about it. 48 eighth graders have to stay home. Quarantine. That's the entire eighth grade volleyball team, right? Oh, man. So we finally get through all those days, and here I am before you today. So can I tell you a little bit about anxiety? Maybe, right? And what happens when you feel anxious? What happens when you have anxieties? You get stressed. I'll tell you what, it feels like something's grabbed onto my heart and squeezing it. I can feel that tension. You just feel this, right? I feel, my heart feels heavy, right? I can't think past it. It just feels compressed. So when my heart feels anxious and it feels compressed, right, part of that position of humility is not thinking about all my problems. And trust me, I could have kept going. Right? It's not thinking about all my problems. How can I think of myself less? Because God's got me handled. Why? Right? Because here it is again. God's got this. Right? God's got this. Absolutely. So how do I think of myself less? Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew, because Peter thought maybe it was an original idea. It turns out Jesus said it first in Matthew. Come to me, all who are labor, all who labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So even with everything going on, my focus can be less on myself and more 
on others because all that I'm anxious about I can cast upon Jesus. And this isn't in my notes, but this helped me a lot. A few weeks ago, I took a great Yosemite hike. It was awesome. I was with my buddy Brian. And I would argue it's not just about my anxieties and trying to put them all on Jesus, but we're talking about these small groups and meeting with people again, talking about Jesus, right? Man, do I get to feel my burdens lighter, right? Where two or three are gathered there, I'm with them. When I get to be with someone else with Jesus, I recently learned, right? This is the devil prowls around looking for someone to devour in Peter, right? To gum us to death, so to speak, to make us feel numb to the pain. When I got to share my life and my belief with Jesus and someone else, man, did I feel lighter. Man, did I get to feel Jesus in those moments. So if I could encourage you to share a little bit there, that's what I have for you. But God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but of yourself less. Peter writes a little bit later on, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. Have you ever heard about being clothed in Christ? Have you heard that phrase maybe once or twice? Or being covered by the blood of the Lamb? Maybe you've heard that. Maybe someone has shaken some holy stuff over you and you heard those few words, right? Covered by the blood of the Lamb. Well, Peter's saying being clothed in Christ. How many layers are we wearing here, right? Is it, is it one layer of this, one layer of that, and then another layer, and then I got Christ on top like an overcoat? That sounds really hot. Well, it's because they're all the same thing. To be clothed in Christ is to be clothed in humility. As it's written in Philippians, though he was God, he did not consider himself equal with God. We got the first part out of the way, right? God opposes the proud. Well, he's certainly not proud. He doesn't consider himself equal to God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took on the humble position of a slave. You've heard it a million times, right? The Son of Man came to be not to be served, but... To, to serve exactly when he appeared in the form as a human in the human form he humbled himself in the obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross not thinking of himself as less but thinking of himself less that's the God that we have right what's the most valuable thing you have your wife your, your life, yeah, God's grace. The most valuable thing you can say you possess is your life, and that's on loan from God, too, right? It's not your house. It's not your car. It's not what's going on in your garage. It's not your boat, right? Jesus gave the most valuable thing a human can have so that you may live. That's thinking of yourself less, to give his life as a ransom for many. So clothe yourself with humility towards one another as Christ did. As he continues to serve us, to love us, through his life, death, and resurrection. We're going to take a little time right now. I know some of you have kids. I certainly have kids myself here, as you probably see them running around. But take this opportunity right now. We're going to have a little bit of prayer time. As you feel God's breath go across you, two things to concentrate on. One, what are the anxieties of your heart that you can lay at the feet of Jesus? But something you can't stop thinking about that for some reason is back from serving others and two who has God put on your heart to serve there's someone God has called to your intention right someone God has called you to notice someone God has just brought to your mind just in recent days in humility know your value to God and think of yourself less so take a little time right now anxieties first and who God's put on your heart to serve. After a few minutes of silence, we'll actually turn to a partner that's here. Just have a little open discussion time about those two topics before we wrap up. Take a few moments of silence.
prayer to Jesus with one another. Find a partner, a group of two, or a group of three by you. We ask this question, how can I pray for you? But just mention some of those anxieties and that person that's on your heart to serve. Let's take an opportunity to pray for one another. Now I'll come up and close. I'd like to invite the worship team back up as we close up worship today. What a great blessing we can have with one another to confess not just fears and anxieties, but sins as well, and just absolve one another of those. It's just a great opportunity to bring it to God. And as we close in prayer with one another, let's close in prayer together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and